utilitarianism, or at least John Stuart Mill's version, and just a uh, excerpt from his work. So Mill begins by addressing the question of what utilitarianism is. And his answer is this, that the foundation of morals is utility, or what he calls the greatest happiness principle. And he defines it in the following way. Actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. And so he has to define happiness and unhappiness. And he does so in a pretty straightforward manner. Happiness is pleasure and the absence of pain. And unhappiness is the opposite, pain and the absence of pleasure. So he provides a guide in terms of deciding what to do. So if you are following Mill's greatest happiness principle and you wanted to do something or didn't want to do something, you would, and you used his principle, you'd say, well, will this promote happiness or will it promote the reverse of happiness? And if it promotes happiness, then it would be right to that degree and if it promoted unhappiness, wrong to that degree. So what he's talking about here is the matter of value. And he also discusses extrinsic versus intrinsic value, putting in somewhat different terms, though, because he says that pleasure and being free from pain are the only things that have intrinsic worth, because he says they're the only things desirable as ends rather than just means. So pleasure for him has an inherent intrinsic positive value, pain, intrinsic negative value. And for all of the things, they're desirable, that is to say they have value based on their pleasure or as a means to promoting pleasure and avoiding pain. So all the things would have extrinsic value in terms of either creating pleasure or avoiding pain. Mill was obviously not the first person to take pleasure as, as a good. Uh, before Mill was even milling, our good dead friend Aristotle uh, raised the objection Mill is considering here, which is the pig objection. And Aristotle made the argument that pleasure uh, cannot be the highest good. And so Mill is aware of these past problems, and he's quite aware of the pig objection, which raises the question, if you're doing philosophy, why bring up an objection against your own view? And the main answer is this is that if you're doing philosophy, you know, honestly, as it should be done, at least in the view that, that I take, the point is to get to truth. And being honest and getting to truth involves honestly presenting problems of one's own view, which is something, you know, pretty unusual in business and politics, etc. But the ideal is, if you're trying to get to truth, you've got to honestly consider problems of your own view. Uh, Mill, of course, thinks he ultimately can handle it because obviously if you uh, believe you have an objection that, that totally destroys your own view, you wouldn't hold that view. You'd switch over to the view of the objection. So what is the pig objection itself? Well, again, it's basically taken from earlier thinkers. He doesn't mention Aristotle, but he does mention the Epicureans. But here's how it goes. Suppose someone says that life has the highest end of pleasure. Well, the criticism is this. That would be a mean, groveling view, a doctrine worthy only of swine. Basically, um, to say pleasure is the highest good is to say that the life of a pig, hence the image of the happy pig, you know, is the highest life. And it's essentially a reductio. This is absurd, so this has got to be, be wrong. Now, later thinkers really punched up this objection, and they bring in some technology. Uh, one, of, one of the early mentions of virtual reality in philosophy involved this. Imagine you could be put into a machine, and it would give you all kinds of wonderful experiences, but none of them are real. Would that be good? And if you really want to punch it up, you can create like a psychotic dystopian future, seemingly, where people are lobotomized, put into you know survival tubes, and have their pleasure centers wired. So they're at maximum pleasure all the time, even though they're effectively lobotomized. 
And if pleasure is the highest good, that dystopian view would seem to be the greatest good. And so the point of this attack is to say making pleasure the highest good just seems wrong because it would make the life of a pig or in the extreme case that I made up, the life of being lobotomized in a tube with a wire in your brain would be the greatest life. And again, this is not the first time the objection has been raised, so Mill can help himself to past objections. The Epicureans, who were um, Greek and Roman thinkers, they took pleasure to be the highest good. And their reply was this, which is a pretty clever one. They turned the tables on the accuser. They said, it's the accuser who is presenting humans in a degraded way, since they are supposing that the only pleasures humans can experience are pig pleasures. And so that's his sort of historical reply. Mill, of course, wants to do them one better. So what is Mill's reply to the pig objection? Well, he kind of builds on the earlier reply, which is this. If humans and pigs had the same same pleasures, then the life uh, you know, of either would be good for either. He thinks that the comparison is degrading to people because the pleasures of a beast won't satisfy our conception of happiness because we have faculties above mere animal appetites. And if we're aware of them, we don't regard as happiness anything that leaves them out. So what he's going to try to do here is make an argument based on difference in quality to try to beat quantity. Because he knows that the raw physical pleasures, you know, they have the highest quantity, sheer volume. So he's going to try to fight it out over quality. Now, being a philosopher, it's not surprising that he would say that the mental pleasures are better than the the raw bodily animal pleasures uh, because of you know certain advantages. But he is willing to say that they're not intrinsically better because again they're all pleasure, and. He does make the argument, make the claim, that his principle of utility, even though it takes pleasure to be the highest good, it does allow for there being degrees of value in pleasure. Why? Well, it makes kind of an appeal to intuitions. In all other cases, we consider both quality and quantity. So it would be absurd to, to say that pleasure is only a matter of quantity, not quality. He doesn't use an analogy, but an obvious analogy would be food. We don't just judge food on sheer quantity. So when you go, when you're hungry and you go to get a meal, I mean, we do consider a quantity, of course, but we don't just say, okay, let's eat this because there's lots of it. We also consider the quality of food. So we'd say that this food is good based on quality and not just quantity. So if we were offered, say, five gallons of you know, unflavored, you know, oatmeal versus, say, a really good pizza, you know, just one good pizza, unless we're, you know, desperate for five gallons of food, we would go with a pizza, higher, higher quality. So that does make sense. So what he has to do is distinguish between the quality of pleasures. And Mill was an empiricist. So he believes essentially that whatever you know about the world comes into the senses. So his test is going to be an empirical test. And here's how he does it. He essentially does kind of like a, you know, like you might have heard of the, um, you know, the taste test between Pepsi and Coke. And the idea is you decide which one is better by which people, more people like. So he's running kind of a version of that. So if you're wondering which pleasure is more desirable, what you do is you would offer that to you know people you know give them the, the the survey and if all or almost all people who experience both prefer one over the other regardless of any moral obligation they they might you know otherwise think they have that would be more desirable and the idea is pretty straightforward uh, if more people you know desire it it's more desirable so how do you test uh, quality? Well, again, he comes up with a pretty good empirical test. To say that one pleasure has superior quality over another, he works out the following, you know, distinction. And 
goes like this. You say, you would say, according to him, one pleasure has a superior quality if those competently acquainted with both prefer it to any quantity of the other, even if accompanied by greater discomfort. So what is he talking about here? Well, this is how his test runs. Suppose you're wondering if, um, you know, suppose you're running, running a uh, hypothetical test. Is the pleasure of, say, friendship greater than the pleasure of, say, drinking alcohol? And Mill would say, well, here's how I do the test. You need someone who's completely acquainted with both. So, for example, if you were putting up uh, playing video games like, you know, World of Warcraft or Call of Duty or Fortnite against uh, going to the ballet, you couldn't just take gamers or ballet fans and just have them assess it. Because obviously the gamers would say, well, gaming, obviously. And the ballet fans would say, ballet, obviously. You need someone who is completely acquainted to, with both. Both a, you know, say a renowned gamer and a renowned fan of the ballet. And so you have a person who can competently judge both. And if, according to Mill, if they would take one over the other, you know, even if they could have as much of the other as they wanted, and even if getting the first one came with more discomfort, that would have superior quality. So basically his test is you need someone who can, can competently judge both. And if they would pick one, say, pleasure A over B, even if they could have more B with little effort, and A came with some discomfort, A has got greater quality, according to Mill, at least. And he doesn't use an argument by analogy here, but you can make you know, a decent case for this. Think of, um, say, gold versus dirt. It's really easy to get a lot of dirt pretty easily. I mean, yeah, you got to shovel it, but it's literally everywhere. But getting gold would require a lot more work. But we regard gold as having superior quality. So we would typically, if we had the chance to actually, you know, get some gold, we would do more work to get gold, even if we could have lots of dirt for, you know, almost no effort. And he's using kind of a similar reason here. So why would people pick, you know, human pleasures over animal pleasures? Well, what he claims is this. Again, he's running his test. If you have someone who can appreciate both, who appreciates both what Mill would consider the finer things, but also, you know, the swinish things, and they ran through this test, Mill claims, as a matter of what he regards as an empirical fact, is that few humans would consent to become an animal even if they got the foolish pleasures. They wouldn't give up their, you know, greater qualities for the complete satisfaction of the lesser desires. And Mill does consider the possibility that someone would accept this, but he claims that this could be explained away. Uh, someone would only do this because their unhappiness was so great that anything would be better. Now, we could use here kind of a sci-fi or magic example. Imagine a mad scientist or mad wizard who um, is benign but mad, and they've developed a way to transform humans into an animal of their choice. And they're benign, so you can trust them. They'll give you an ironclad contract that if you're turned into, say, a golden retriever or you know whatever animal you want, they guarantee you'll be the, the happiest golden retriever. And Mill claims that if people were given that choice, they would, unless they were in such dire circumstances that anything would be preferable to their life, they would always take their human existence, or so he claims. Why? Well, one reason, of course, that we would suffer more is because, as you might imagine, using the dog example, dogs have a pretty low threshold of being happy. They, you know, food, warmth, shelter, basic kindness, they're happy. Uh, us humans, we're almost never happy. Once we get food and shelter and basic kindness, we always want more. And of course, even though obviously dogs and other animals can suffer, humans can have even more suffering because not only can we suffer physically, we can also, you know, think about our suffering and, um, you know, really contemplate it. Not to say that dogs don't feel, but we can really, you know, really pump up our suffering by thinking and anticipating about more suffering. 
But despite these liabilities, he claims, we don't want to be going into a lower existence. And he considers some possibilities. Maybe pride, maybe love of liberty, personal independence, you know, dignity, etc. But he claims, as a matter of empirical fact, which of course we can assess, that we would prefer remaining human. Or so he claims. So Mill considers happiness and contentment. And he reasons like this, that if you have uh, like a human compared to an animal, that to say that the human is less happy than the animal in equal circumstances is to confuse happiness and contentment. And he says that, you know, in his somewhat well-known lines that it's better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied, better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. And if the fool or pig think otherwise, it's because they only know their side, while the other party knows both. So his reasoning essentially is, is that a uh, person over an animal, the person may be dissatisfied, but they're better off in a way, because they're happier, even though they have less contentment. Now, Mill considers a obvious objection against this view, which is this, that many people who are capable of higher pleasures postpone them for the lower pleasures. Now, Mill claims that this behavior is compatible with the higher pleasures being, being better pleasures. But he has to explain why this occurs, because again, his, his whole argument is the higher quality pleasures, the way you determine them is people who understand both, pick one over the other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But he does have an explanation. He does say that people from weakness will choose a nearer, though lesser, good. So they pick what's closer. And this is um, known as uh, discounting the future. The idea being is that people place more value on something that's closer in terms of you know getting it rather than something that's more valuable um, that's you know further out or farther out in time. For example, consider uh, how people pursue pleasures that injure their health, although they do know that health is the greater good. To use a concrete example, centuries ago when I was in grad school, many of the grad students um, smoked uh, for various reasons, stress relief, etc., etc. Uh, my thing was running. It still is running, so I didn't, didn't smoke. And one of the professors was also a marathon runner. And I think he kind of delighted in running the class, you know, there's one of these seminar classes that was pretty long, and kind of um, running a little, you know, have, he'd have a break, but he'd, he'd kind of run to the break a bit. And I think he enjoyed seeing the smokers kind of squirm and suffer because they needed that, that sweet, sweet nicotine. And then, of course, when the break would arrive, the smokers would run out and start chain smoking to ease their pain. And one of the people in the class uh, said, you know, was talking to someone who was smoking and said to her, you know, smoking is really bad for you. And, of course, she immediately said, gosh, I didn't know that and gave up smoking forever. Well, no, of course not. All smokers know that smoking is really bad for them. And they... They know what it does. They know, you know, emphysema, cancer, health issues, etc. And this person gave back a brilliant, you know, response, nicely illustrating Mill's point. When the other student said, hey, you know, smoking is bad for you. Um, she said, yes, I know, taking a puff. And she said, the cancer and the emphysema is far, far in the future. But the smoky goodness is right here, right now. And so she was nicely proving Mill's point. She completely understood that she was making a bad choice, something dangerous to her health, and was doing so not because health was inferior to smoking, but because the pleasure of smoking was right here, right now, and the long-term pleasure of health um, is way far in the future. Uh, the story does have a happy ending. The person eventually stopped smoking, uh, now does tri triathlons, so they have a, a new vice, one that is less likely to kill them early, less likely. So Mill's response, you know, first response is that people pick the worse over the better because of discounting the future. His second response is this, that people pick 
the inferior, not because they want the inferior, but because they're the only ones that they have access to, or the only ones they can now enjoy. These could, doesn't give an example, but we could think of a case where a person is in a terrible economic situation, they have to work in those you know, long hours, there's not a lot of opportunity for them to do other things, and all they have access to is what we consider the, you know, Mill would say the inferior pleasures. And so he does have, you know, two responses to that objection. So in terms of how we sort out, you know, which pleasure is better, he goes to the competent judge standard. So he essentially using kind of a democratic empirical process. The better of two pleasures is settled by the judgment of the majority who have knowledge of both. And again, a critical point for Mill is, is you got to have knowledge of both. So if you're judging, say, ballet versus playing Call of Duty, you got to have someone who equally understands, equally appreciates, you know, poning the noobs and doing a um, plie. I think, I guess that's a ballet move. Well, anyways, whatever the, whatever the move is in ballet. That's to demonstrate my ignorance of ballet. And he claims that's a sole standard for quality and quantity. And he says, uh, applying the standard, the majority of people would take remaining human over being a super happy animal. And so he believes that he has, through this long and torturous journey, sliced the pig objection into bacon and made a fine sandwich from it. Or you could prefer the tofu objection if you're not a fan of the bacon. So next we'll move on to more utilitarianism.